I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. And welcome to the challenge. Uh, as always, first and foremost, I want to thank God for the opportunity and thank you, the viewers, for tuning in. Uh, this morning's challenge is brought to you from Waterbury. Uh, this is Grassroots TV at its best, and uh, Waterbury is certainly a part of uh, the uh, equation uh, considered by a lot in the state of Connecticut to be the center of the universe, if you will, uh, certainly uh, has been out front and uh, front and center, if you will, with respects to uh, the politics in the state of Connecticut, uh, the wealthiest state per capita in the country, uh, with uh, unfortunately some of the most impoverished cities uh, in America as well. Uh, our guest this morning is uh, the former state NAACP, State Conference NAACP president, political activist, uh, in my, my opinion, a maverick, pioneer, someone who has worked and continues to work uh, to try to make a difference in the community and certainly at the grassroots level. Uh, welcome, my friend, Jimmy Griffin. How you doing, Russ? Good, good, good. Thanks for coming, man. I appreciate you coming in this morning. I wanted to uh, make sure that others were aware of what was happening in the center of the universe, Waterbury, Connecticut. And I can't think of someone who has, uh, you know, uh, with your background, who has spent as much time uh, with those folks who are in the trenches, those people who are trying to, uh, you know, uh, qu uh, carve out a quality of life that hopefully uh, you know, makes all of us better. Uh, those people are in, who are in the trenches have been left out because uh, they haven't been represented by government. But you uh, have uh, held on to an issue for a long time. Uh, I was reading in the Observer. Uh, uh, it talks about Alderman by district. And it mentions Jimmy Griffin in the uh, article a couple of times. I'm just going to read you uh, something real brief, and I'm going to have you respond to it. It said, no one saw it coming, not even the proponents for electing Alderman by district in Waterbury. The election day mandate shocked the political power structure in the city and surprised the handful of individuals championing the issue. 21 of 20 of 21 precincts voted in favor of electing the legislative body of city government by district, something you've been working on since 1995 when you were the political action chair of the NAACP, uh, the Waterbury branch. Yes, Russ. All right. It, uh, it, give us give us your perspective. Well, well what happened was uh, I had been uh, absent from Waterbury for a number of years, I had lived in Bridgeport and New Haven and uh, New York. Uh, and when I came back to Waterbury, uh, my mother had passed. I came back to Waterbury and, you know, uh, I was sort of sitting around and sure. working in North Haven back and forth. Uh, and uh, and I noticed that there was something strange about the uh, electoral process of Waterbury that I had never seen any place before mm -hmm. uh, in my involvement. So I, you know, I started to analyze it, look at it. And then I ran for state rep, as a matter of fact, on the Republican ticket in uh, 1994 <laughs> against Reggie Beeman in the 72nd District of Waterbury. 
which was one of the minority majority districts that was created because of the fact that we had no minority representation in the state house at wow. the time. Wow. Uh, in 95, they had no black or Latino aldermen on the board of aldermen of a 15 member board with almost 50% of the population of Waterbury, Connecticut, they had no aldermen on the board of uh, aldermen that were from a minority, minority community. Wow. Uh, which, uh, it, it amazed me. I said, what's going on? So I started to look at this thing. And I found out that people were being elected by la at large. Sure. And at large elections historically have been a dilution of the minority vote in the various inner cities uh, around the country. It's been always a controversial thing with the Voting Rights Act and, uh, and gerrymandering and a lot of other things that were involved. And I said, wow, wow, you know, there's, there's something that we need to look at. Uh -huh. So I, you know, I gathered a bunch of people together. Well, as the chairman of the political action committee, uh, being this was my idea, I, I got some people together because I knew we couldn't play a racial thing with this. We had to have other people involved in the community. So I got the word, I formed what you call the Waterbury Coalition for Better Government. Okay. That coalition involved the Latinos, the Blacks, the Irish, the Italians, you know. We had uh, a diverse group of people sitting around the table and we figured out that the only way that we could stop this was we would have to try to reform the government to charter revision and then go for all of them and by district. And mm. that's how it all started. Okay. 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 Uh, and from that point on, it's been a struggle, an uphill struggle. We had a charter revision. Uh, we had a non-binding referendum as a result. That was right after I became the president of the local branch of the NAACP. Mm -hmm. That I used that as one of my major agenda items and pushed forward the idea of electing all of them by district. Um, the the Republicans at the time resisted, and what they did is they set up a situation where we had to do a non-binding referendum to test the waters, they say, to prove that this was something that was needed in the city of Waterbury. Mm. We did that. Mm. And uh, then we came back and they did a, a regular referendum and lost it by about 300 votes. Uh, it was 23,000 uh, votes cast. Uh, and that was that was against Alderman by district. That, no, that, that was that, was, that, was, that was that it was against. What happened was it got shot down because the plan that they put up wasn't a plan that was acceptable to most of the people in the city. But it would have been a plan for change, but they still shot it down because the two political parties were not going to allow uh, their machines to be broken up. Well, let's let's start with the foundation of this, if you will. The foundation is that there is there was no representation of or minority representation within government. That was, that's basically what, what existed and what had been uh, the way that politics existed within the city of Waterbury for, for forever. I mean, you know, you basically had a city that was predominantly minority or had uh, a sufficient uh, number of minorities, 30, 40, 50%, 60% minorities, but nobody within government was a minority. Is it, that, is it, that? Exactly. That's the, okay. Exactly. So and, there was nobody on the board of aldermen. There's an 18, is it 18 member board of aldermen? Exactly. Was a minority. Was a minority. Uh, up and until, uh, and, until we brought this issue forth. Once okay. we brought this issue forth and it became a front lay, a front page story. Right. And we were pushing it. Right. Then the political parties said, oh, we got to do something about this. We got to fix this. Mm. Okay. So what they did is they went back and uh, to their town committees, uh, they started to nominate some blacks and Latinos. Okay. 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 Uh, I remember uh, one of the political leaders uh, at the time, uh, an Irish uh, leader, uh, Franny Sullivan. Franny said to me, hey, we gave you a black and we gave you a Latino, Griffin. What else do you want? Mm. Okay. So they gave you two out of 18, two, which they know two, could two not impact. Two right. out of 15, and which they know in no way could impact the political process because they only represented two votes. Exactly. And and there would be really no impact upon okay, them. Okay, and they would be beholden to the parties just like everybody else because the outlaw system was a party structure that was set up that had what you call a minority party set aside. In the state of Connecticut, they require any at large election to have what you call a minority party set aside, which means that there's people that will be elected that really didn't get elected 
that would have to be put on that board because they want to ensure some checks and balances, they call checks and balances. But these were the two parties divvying out. For instance, there was 15 people elected. Of the 15, nine people would only get elected. You could only vote for nine people. Mm -hmm. The other six would automatically be seated. And who would decide who those people were who would get to seat them? The, 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 the state statute. The state statute. So all they had to do was be on the ballot? That's right. So out of, your chances of winning an election in Waterbury, if you were nominated by a town committee, were 83%. Oh. In other words, 18 people were running, 15 would get elected. That's nine, a, of them, nine of them you wouldn't, uh, six of them you would get a chance to vote for. Uh, that seems completely unfair. It's un American. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that's not just happening in Waterbury, you're saying. That's happening in at-large elections statewide. Well, so where well, there's only a few at-large systems in the state of Connecticut in urban areas, and Hartford is one of them, I think. Yes, I okay. think Hartford is an um, at-large there. And they're, but they have pretty good representation as far as their minorities' population is right, concerned, even right. though they're at-large. Right, right, right. So it doesn't affect Hartford as far as the de demographics are concerned. Right, right. All right. But the problem is, for instance, in New Haven, you have 30 wards. All right. That's wards. That's a smaller subdivision. Sure. Okay. Uh, in Bridgeport, you have 10 districts, two from each district, which gives you a 20-member board of it, uh, all of it. Uh-huh. All right, we had to fight for that. That was when I was in Bridgeport to get that changed, all right, so that we would have district representation in Bridgeport. Uh, there's hybrid systems like in Danbury, uh, you have 21 uh, people that are elected and out of the 21, I think it's something like 13 or something like that, 14 that are, are a district and seven at large. Uh, Norwalk has a system where you have something like 10 by district and five at large. Uh, Stanford has 40, 40 councilman in Stanford, Connecticut, where the governor comes from. Okay. 40? I didn't know. 40, 40 representatives. I never, never at, realized By that. district in Stanford. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. So Stanford has one of the most, uh, actually the smallest uh, representation areas out of the state of Connecticut. And he was the governor, running for governor. I couldn't feel, I said, I was saying, why would a governor that's running for governor, and we have a referendum question like all of them by district on Waterbury, all right, that's disenfranchising the African-American and Latino voters, why wouldn't people that have systems that know that representation is needed weigh in on it? That's a very interesting question. I, I didn't think, well, it, it, that there were that many in Stanford. So what you're saying is that the gerrymandering that's taken place, the lines that are drawn in Stanford allow for 40... 40 members to be on council that's right so every section of the city it's, i don't know how every section of the, of the city, city has a representative. a representative on council oh yes every and, section. and that and the governor knowing that that's the case never weighed in on alderman by district in the in the city of Waterbury, because it was a, a, a local democratic party machine that resisted that it would be political suicide for him to get involved in something like that. So he just stayed away from it. I don't think that he was against it. Okay. 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 But I think that it, by the nature of the political machine on a local level, he had to stay away from it. Wow. Wow. You know, this is, uh, I, I think actually this, quite frankly, is uh, something that uh, will have national appeal. Uh, I would think that most folks would, uh, would think that they have some representation uh, from their particular areas on on those councils uh, as a part of the political process. But what you're saying is that for years there have been people who have been elected to seats who do not represent districts or certain areas of certain cities. Exactly. And that's what that was the big call. And then uh, then in 2010, when they saw a real movement, and that was again. I, right. I organized uh, the NAACP, the the uh, Coalition for Better Government. Right, right, and right. We got a coalition together. Right. And we came before the charter revision with right. 150 people. Okay. okay. And we we urged them to put something on a ballot. 
They didn't put anything on the ballot. They shot it down again. They thought it was dead in the water after that. They thought it was going to die. Uh, unfortunately, in 2004, what happened for them was that they mandated that they had to do charter revision at least one time every 10 years. Okay, okay. So in 2004, 2014 came around, and they had slept it. They didn't realize that they had to do it, but I knew it because I remember it, and this was close to my heart, so I stayed on top of it. Wow. So I went back to them, and I said, you got to do charter revision this right. year. Yeah. You're mandated to do charter revision this right. year. Right, yeah. Okay, and then all of a sudden, they had to put together a charter revision commission. Right. Wow. I want to read something here that uh, the Waterbury Observer, the writer John Mary, uh, John Murray uh, says, he says, in, you know, when we asked the question, how did it happen? He said there are a hundred different reasons why uh, Waterbury voted to elect Alderman by district. The issue had been raised and vetted in the 1990s uh, by Jimmy Griffin, the Coalition for Better Government, the NAACP, the Spanish Action Council, the Waterbury Neighborhood Council, and the Waterbury Observers. We're going to have to take a break right here, but we're going to come right back and talk about how it happened again and uh, why you st you stuck to it and why uh, this is making such a, a, an impact on the way elections are being uh, uh, carried out and, and the impact that it'll have on, on uh, all of us in the future. Exactly, Russ. Give us a moment. We'll be right back. How do you judge a law firm's success? Cases won, money made, or what the firm does in the community. At Dressler Strickland, we know that success is just the beginning. The true measure of success is what you do with it. For 33 years, we've used our success to help our neighbors and our community. 24 7, 11 22. Whenever you need us, we'll be there. Dressler Strickland, building communities one case at a time. Hi, my name is Leal Williams. Like it, watch it, share it. Everyone's watching AccessTV.org. at Tall Books in Harvard want to remind parents, kids need to exercise the most important muscle in their body, the brain. How do you do that? Read. What happens? Well, let me tell you. The imagination soars, the creativity blossoms, the world opens up, and the need to be entertained by outside forces diminishes. Don't believe me? Try it. You won't be sorry and in time, either will your kids. Cold Book cares about your child's literacy. Join Miss Cleo every week on Miss Cleo's Storytelling Corner online at accesstv.org. Yeah, John Murray writes in the Waterbury Observer how it happened, and he identifies uh, a, f a few groups that uh, have been holding on to and been uh, were at least a part of the initial action for this particular issue, Alderman by District, and he cites the uh, Waterbury Coalition for Better Government, uh, the NAACP, the Spanish Action Council and Water, Waterbury Neighborhood Council and the Observer. And, you know, I, I can't help but, uh, you know, think about, uh, you know, the fact that the reason why you took on the issue was because at the time you were the political action chair for the branch, uh, the Waterbury branch of the NAACP. Correct. And so, uh, you know, 
this is certainly a civil rights issue, Jimmy. You know, to me, uh, you know, minority representation or blacks or, you know, when you have that kind of concentration of blacks who are unrepresented or underrepresented in government, uh, that's, to me, uh, you know, unequal. Well, that's one of the, the key issues of the uh, NAACP uh, nationwide right now. Absolutely. And the Voting Rights Act, uh, the, the, uh, the ID laws, all this stuff surrounds elections and elections process and disenfranchisement uh, of elections. Which begs the question, you know, where is the, uh, you know, the NAACP with respect uh, to the issue of aldermen by district? I mean, this is a great thing. This, to, to me, this is nationwide. Uh, this, is, this has a national appeal. You're, when you say alderman by district, you're talking about every district within the city having representation placed on, on the governing body for that particular municipality. Exactly. That's, what, that's the way I would think that, uh, you know, democracy is intended to be. And that's what, that's what the NAACP is supposed to be about, um, tackling these kinds of issues. Right. Uh, I'm so, I was shocked uh, that the NAACP was not there to celebrate this victory because this victory was originated within the NAACP. Right. And uh, I was disheartened to know that I had been suspended from the NAACP because of my uh, questioning of the integrity or or concerned about the integrity of the organization two years ago this month, as a matter of fact. Uh, I don't want to digress too, too much from the Alderman by district issue, but you, a former state, President suspended from the NAACP? Yeah, well, you remember uh, two years ago, I did an, uh, a show on this very channel uh, defending or challenging that decision that was made to suspend me from the NAACP. And, well, and well it was, can and, you, and you just since then, you give since, us a quick, just a quick reason why? I think uh, that it was all political. I think it had to do with the local and state politics and the fact that the NAACP was entrenched with the democratic hierarchy in the state of Connecticut, uh, that uh, the uh, Ben Jealous and uh, Scott Esdell were tied to uh, Governor Malloy in relationship to the death penalty thing. Uh, and they wanted wow. me to be silenced in and, and Waterbury because I'm one of the people that was vocal and they didn't want any local branches to really interfere with anything that was going on at the state level. So what has happened is that the state conference has become a political machine rather than a civil rights machine. That is certainly very unfortunate. And, and frankly, it kind of saddens me, obviously, for a lot of reasons. And uh, I, again, I don't want to detract from the issue of Alderman uh, by district, but this certainly is a civil rights issue. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, everybody should be, uh, you know, frankly, uh, concerned, if you will, about whether or not they are receiving fair representation. As a matter, fact, miss, it, miss as a matter of fact, right now, Russell, the most crucial part of this is that we've got this passed. It's on the, it's, it's a, it's got to be Well, now the gerrymandering has to take now, place now. now the lines, so the lines, the lines have to be drawn. drawn. Yeah. There's an article in the paper today talking about they want to be non-political with the people that they pick, but they got two politicians picking the people that are going to be on the commission that's going to sit over the line drawing. Where's the NAACP? Where's right. the state NAACP? Right. Where's the national NAACP? Right. This right. is a huge issue. Absolutely. All right. We should have the Justice Department come in to monitor this whole process because the reason that we're sitting here and talking about it is a result of the disenfranchisement of Black and Latino voters over a period of 50 years, not just 20 years, Right. okay? There's never been more than three board of all of the members of color at any given time in the history of Waterbury. That's racist. Uh, there's, uh, the newspaper has been ex extremely racist when it comes to uh, uh, blacks and Latinos in the city of Waterbury. Uh, the civil service system, uh, when it comes to the fire department, the police department, the uh, education department, all the major departments, the boards and commissions are all dominated by white males. Okay, what is going on? And nobody has been saying anything about this for years. And this is why, if you read one of the comments, the last comment on 
there. They, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been just keeping the issue alive because I couldn't allow it to be buried, all right, with all the political bull that was going on in the city of Waterbury. Well, you know, I, honestly, you know, in all fairness, I, I, I think it's, you know, you know, the position you take with respects to the, uh, the the papers and their unobjectivity that, you know, the uh, the lack of concern, if you will, for those who are not being represented, uh, you know, it, it actually uh, sounds like Connecticut to a lot of people outside of Connecticut. I mean, we're grassroots TV, but obviously there are a lot of people from around uh, the country and from around the world who uh, from occasionally tune into what we talk about because uh, at at the grassroots level, uh, all politics really are local. Well, that's what and, I. That's and, what my argument and, is. Sure, my argument sure. is is that we are so focused on the state and the national governments to deliver for us, we miss the ball because everything happens at the local level. The governor sends money to the mayor. Right, I, right, right. If the mayor doesn't and, and, it, and what's really interesting is, how, you know, the conversation that you and I are having is the conversation that's had more often than not at this level, at the grassroots level. People are wondering why government doesn't work. It, they had it, it, it. People are losing confidence in government. You know, you you've had these snafus occur in elections in Hartford and and in other places, and you know, folks are just. Uh, you, you know, now we understand to a, a great degree why it is so, because it's a deliberate attempt to dilute the, um, uh, the, the power the, the, on the local level, the power on the local level. OK, because yeah. that's where the power is at. Yeah. The power is in the neighborhood. Yeah. All right. And the family, the neighborhood and then the, the greater community sure okay it, sure. it comes from the bottom up right politics is not from the top down right revolutions are not started from the top down they started from the bottom up this is a revolution okay great point. Uh, what happened in waterbury is a flipping of a political system that's been entrenched with corruption uh nepotism and all the things, cronyism, yeah, yeah. and everything that you can And the think history of. of Waterbury is well documented. Well, you I had mean, three you know, mayors that went to jail. Yeah, you had Santa Petro who went to jail. You had uh, Giordano. Giordano, who was a he was you a, had a governor he was a senator, that went to jail. Uh, yes. Giordano was a yeah okay and, right. and who else was there? And then you had um, Roland, 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 Roland who was jail. Jail. Yeah. Then you had Bergen who was indicted yeah. in the same year that this all started yeah. in nineteen ninety five. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All of this was going on, and Waterbury has been noted to be one of the most corrupt places in the United States. I mean, it's not something that's new. It's been reported over and over again as a sin city. So what I'm saying is that we as a people in Waterbury have been enslaved in an institution of educational racism. All right, the educational system is 78% or 80% black and Latino. Wow. And you've got less than five or 10% of the teachers and administrators as black and Latino. Wow. I got to admit, you, you know, you're made of something a little different than most, Jimmy, because, uh, you know, the allegations or the perspective that you bring uh to uh you know this conversation in my opinion uh is unprecedented uh there are a few folks who are willing uh you know to uh, actually uh, come out and and say it just like it is and and obviously you know over your years of activism and uh that's why i referred to you earlier as a bit of a maverick i mean you know people uh, consider you and even the observer uh, points out that they thought that some may view you as a bit of a polarizing figure. What do you say to stuff like that? Well, my problem is, is that anybody that s talks about justice and equality becomes a polarizing figure when you have a system that resists the kinds of equality that you're asking for. If you're saying blacks and Latinos are disenfranchised, white folks are in denial. Yeah. They don't want to believe that. Yeah. That's yeah. something they don't want to believe. Yeah. I mean, my grandfather and my great-grandfather, what they did does not impact on what's happening today. But look at the numbers. 
Right. Look at the educational system. Look at the disparity. Look at the unemployment rate. Right. Look at all those things. And then yeah. tell me, how could you possibly make an argument that I'm a racist or I'm a race baiter when I bring to your attention the inequality that you inflicted on my people? Yeah. And the numbers bear it out because the incarceration rates and, uh, you know, the things that you referred to earlier, the uh, unemployment and the underemployment, all of those things uh, seem to be disproportionately, uh, you know, <laughs> things that impact. And it's, and it's politics. Yeah. It's yeah. politics. Right. It's, uh, you know, and, and we have to understand that politics is not a nice game like a lot of people think it may be. Right. And that it, it takes real backbone to it, address the it's, it's a business is what it's a saying. business. Yeah. It's, it's a it's a capitalistic society. Yeah. It's about who has and who doesn't have. Uh, this is the way it operates. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, uh, if you got uh, a large voting block, right. you control a piece of the pie. If you don't have unity, you don't have no pie. All right. You could gerrymander. I saw this happen in Indianapolis, Indiana, for instance. They had districts. What they did is they cut it like a piece of pie. All right. And they cut a piece of pie like this, which means that the bigger the district gets on the out outside of the district. Right. The less populated it is, yeah. the more affluent it is. Yeah. On the inner city, which is from 10th Street down to 1st Street, uh -huh. all right, and then you got 20th Street up to 30th Street that may be inclusive of more upper income people. Right. They have representation on the board in the district, and nobody on the inner city has any representation in that district because they're outnumbered because of gerrymandering. Now, is that part of the reason why, uh, you know, it, it, or could part of the reason be that they are uh, contributing more uh, as taxpayers to, uh, you know, the revenues of the, the system itself? Of course, of course. But <laughs> how do you get to those neighborhoods if you don't have a step up? Or even uh, uh, a playing field that's, right. that's level. Right, right. How do you get to the neighborhood that they live in? Right. If you don't get the opportunity to come out of the neighborhood you live in. Right, right. right. Okay. And that's because we have allowed ourselves to be enslaved in a political system because we don't have any kind of commonality, any kind of common interests. We're not ethnic like a lot of other groups. We're all over the place. Right, right. All right. The Latinos are black, white, green, yellow. They're all colors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Black yeah. people are the same. Right. Yeah. But we don't have the same kind of common language that they do. We don't have the kind common of interest, it common interests. Common interest. Yeah. Yeah. But they yeah. usually benefit from our inactivity or our activity about inactivity mm. okay and that's and that's why you know it, it seems like you know the apathy seems to continue to come up i mean uh you know the turnout for these elections uh you it know keeps going it's dwindling, down it's dwindling yeah and then they say well you don't vote yeah why don't you vote yeah. because if you vote it doesn't make any difference it doesn't matter because it, it's still with the uh, at large districts those people who have those lines drawn and, and they, or, or, I call that socialization apathy. Yeah. Okay. Where they socialize you, they give you the food stamps, they give you the welfare, they give you all the things yeah. that you need just to survive. Right. Okay. And by giving you these things, you become dependent on the system. Right. That's why I'm sort of anti democratic philosophy and a pro Republican philosophy to a certain degree because right. of that whole concept. They want you dependent upon the system. They want so you, to you be, so you can continue to come back to them, you know, exactly. whatever. Exactly. They control your destiny yeah. in your communities. Yeah. They put an anti poverty program in the middle of your community yeah. and they direct where the services go. Yeah. All right. And they keep you right there. Yeah. They don't give you elevated job yeah. opportunities. Yeah. Wow. I tell you, this has been. <laughs> an amazing, amazing show, even from my own perspective this morning. I, I can't tell you how much uh, I appreciate you coming. We've got to continue this dialogue. I mean, we've got to find out uh, why, uh, you know, we've got to find the, the answers, if you will, to some of the problems. I mean, this is certainly a solution, you know, to uh, the problems the that answer, we've impacted. The answer is our mindset. Yes. 
We have a yes. mindset that we have been con conditioned to believe that we're incapable of being effective as a unit. But we are effective as a unit if a Russell and Jimmy Griffin come together, for instance, Amen. Or, or Stanley. We come together to put out the message that we're putting out today. That's power. Well okay. said. Well said. Jimmy Griffin has met the challenge this morning. Uh, he <laughs> working on an issue for almost 20 years, and now it's come to fruition. Uh, Alderman by district in the uh, city of Waterbury, the center of the universe, some would say, in the state of Connecticut. Uh, this has been a great show this morning. I uh, am encouraged to continue to press on. And uh, we certainly hope Jimmy will come back and give us greater insight and uh, tell us what happens now that the decisions have been made uh, to have Alderman by district. Uh, this has been the challenge with Russell Williams. Remember, be blessed.